Hello everyone, it's Jabari here. Throughout history, in an era long before modern firearms, the bow and arrow was one of the most powerful weapons to enter the arsenal of mankind. A technology found in all parts of the world since prehistoric times, with the exception of the Australian continent. For millennia, the ability to aim and launch a projectile weapon from a safe distance is what has enabled humans to stand out from all other apex predators of the animal kingdom. In turn, it is also what has produced some of the world's most powerful armies in history, with those able to master the skill of the bow on a massive scale, consistently outperforming their primarily melee-based rivals, notably the Mongols, Huns, and Scythians. Later, the English longbow revolutionized warfare in Europe, with its ability to pierce armor while losing far more arrows in a shorter amount of time than its crossbow counterparts. Even the Japanese were renowned for their skill in the use of their traditional bow known as the Yumi, and Native American civilizations consistently produced societies with strong traditions of archery. So, where does the African continent come into play in the world's history of archery tradition? In Sub-Saharan Africa, the Nubians are by far the most famous Africans in regards to strong archery traditions, and were renowned in the ancient world for their skill with the bow, with the Egyptians frequently recruiting them as mercenaries in their armies, and referring to their lands as Taseti, which literally translates to Land of the Bow. Today, most of Sub-Saharan African archery is largely overlooked, and focus is primarily placed on the small bush bows of the Central and Southern African hunter-gatherer peoples with their poisoned, needle-like arrows that they use exclusively for hunting wild game. However, the oldest known evidence of archery in the world was discovered in the Sibudu Cave of South Africa, and dates back to 64,000 years ago. With that being said, it should come as no surprise that the African continent has a wide variety of ancient and well-developed bowyer traditions, some of which have no like elsewhere in the world, and we will be discussing one of those traditions, hailing from West Africa, with extra emphasis on the Basa people. The bows of the Basa people are similar in construction to the aforementioned English longbow, being made of a single long piece of wood and having lots of power or draw weight. However, unlike the English longbow which averaged 6 foot 6 inches in length, the Basa bows seldom exceeded 5 foot 6 inches in length, as they were constructed based on the height of their owners. However, it is worth noting that a European explorer by the name of Richard St. Barb Barker reportedly spotted six-foot-tall peoples of equatorial Africa using bows taller than themselves. So anyway, the Basa bows were typically constructed of a type of wood related to the North American locust family of trees. The wood is then cut into staves and left to dry in the sun for several months before being cut to shape. Some neighboring peoples, however, would create recurve bows cutting and shaping it by heating the wood while it was still fresh and green and then leaving it to dry afterwards. The Basa people tended to exclusively use straight pieces of wood without the recurve, which they would then wrap with strings or metal rings in the center. The strings of these bows consisted of antelope hide, which would be cut into thin strips while it was still wet. After drying, it was braided into a string and knotted on both ends before being stretched to evenly distribute its suppleness. The string was then attached to the bow by creating a hole on the end of each limb with a red-hot iron pin and forcing the knots through those holes. Afterwards, the string was then wrapped through a notch at the tip of the bow to prevent the knot from slipping through the holes. This technique was unique to the African continent, practiced only among the Basa people and some other African groups. When not in use, the bow was left unstrung to reduce the tension but restrung before warring or hunting. Among the Basa people, a sign of immense pride was to have a bow so powerful that the owner was the only one strong enough to draw it back. This was a show of masculinity, and those with the strongest bows were always looked upon with the highest esteem and greatest strength. This tradition was so valuable that in fact, an entirely new device was invented by the Basa people among other groups of West Africa including the Tiv and Mada. 
This device known as the manga was used to bear down on the string as it was drawn back. I couldn't find any detailed descriptions as to how exactly it was used in conjunction with the bow, but my guess is that the string of the bow would cling to the crossguard, for lack of a better word, as the loop was firmly grasped with a tight grip of the hand and drawn back. As the archer aimed the bow, he'd simply angle the dagger slightly as to allow the string to slip off whenever he was ready to release the arrow. Again, this is all just speculation, but at the very least, we do know a few things for sure. It served the same purpose as an arrow release on modern bows, but was also used as a dagger, and quite literally already in hand if an enemy attempted to engage the archer from behind in close combat. It was also used to perform coup de grace on fallen animals or enemies to end their suffering. Its primary purpose, however, was to prevent the strong and very painful tension that the string would have otherwise have on the archer's bare fingers. And I can tell you from personal experience that even modern bows of low draw weights of 30 to 35 pounds will rub your fingers raw after shooting enough times. While I was unable to find the exact draw weight of the Basa bow, I think it's safe to assume that it likely exceeded 100 pounds, as did the English longbow. Especially considering they had to use an arrow release to bear the immense draw weight and how their entire culture prided itself on who had the strongest bow. What's notable about these strong archery cultures mentioned is that they all successfully defend themselves against Muslim Fulani incursions, just as did the Nubian archers against the Rashidun Caliphate in the Battle of Dongola. But anyway, now let's talk about their arrowheads. African archers arguably have the widest variety of arrowhead types in the world, all with their own specific functions. One notable example is the Mercy Arrow, which the Basa called the Kapiasa which has a convex shape designed to speed the death of the wounded target. The Basa arrowheads were made of iron and came in three main types. Primarily, their construction is designed to cut rather than pierce and hang in the body of a target like a fish hook to deposit as much poison as possible. However, they did have one type of arrow that was designed to pierce and was used to hunt small game like birds. This was their smallest arrow a blunt arrow was also constructed for the same purpose. The Basa also had a medium-sized arrow that measured up to 3 inches long, which was similar in appearance to a small knife and could function as one if need be. This particular arrow type is favored by the Basa people because it has a wide variety of uses and is said to have the straightest and most accurate flight trajectory. They could sometimes be barbed in resemblance to the spines of the dorsal fins of a catfish. The largest arrow used by the Basa could be up to 4 inches long and were compared to flying knives. They were designed for punitive warfare or large game hunting, but because of their heavy and cumbersome weight, they were seldom used. The poison used for the arrowheads was so potent that an elephant could reportedly be killed before making it 500 yards away after the initial shot, and a baboon would drop dead within 15 seconds of being struck. The poison is soaked into all of the grooves and barbs of arrows and left to dry in the sun before being stored in a quiver. To prevent self-injury or fratricide, every archer carried an antidote. The recipes for both the poisons and the antidotes are unknown to present, as they were closely guarded by the families who created them. As a lover of both archery and world history, I think it's a real shame that we tend to place so little focus in documenting African history in virtually every category. I hope that one day in the future, more emphasis is placed in the realms of African history, and it is my goal to do my part to make that a reality. If you enjoyed the video, please show your support by leaving a comment, a like, and subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like these. For sources, check out my website, linked below. If you'd like to support future projects, you can do so there as well or by clicking the join button below, or by becoming a patron. I hope you all enjoyed the video, thanks for watching as usual, and always remember, we don't come from nothing.